Well, I don't know if you've ever felt alone against the world. Uh, Very often when we go through changing seasons of life, we feel like we're alone against the world. Maybe that's where you're at right now. I remember when Mel and I had Jack, our oldest, and he was crying through the night like every night. He was a really colicky baby. We were just physically exhausted. We were sleep deprived. And I remember feeling so alone against the world. Maybe you feel alone because you've got a newborn, or maybe you feel alone because you've got an empty nest. Maybe you feel alone because you're trying to figure out what you're going to do when you graduate high school or what you're going to do when you finish college. Maybe you feel alone against the world because your body is aging. We all go through these different seasons, changing seasons of life where the people around us move or our relationships change and what we could count on for fulfillment or what we could count on for stability, it changes and we find ourselves struggling. I've been in that place so many times in my life and I remember especially feeling that way right when I finished my undergrad in journalism. I graduated from college and I had three worldly possessions. I had this 1986 Mercury Capri with a five liter V8 and a five speed transmission. She was a beautiful, beautiful machine. Loved this car. I had that, I had a guitar, I had my MacBook laptop that I would write my news articles on and I had about $150. And I I got a a job offer in the Phoenix area, and so I drove across country. I remember getting a flat tire in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I had to spend about half of all the money I had to replace the tire. Uh, So then, you know, no more hotels, definitely sleeping in the car at rest stops for the rest of the drive to Arizona. I remember arriving in Phoenix, really all alone in a metro area of about four million people, And, you know, kind of optimistic and excited on the one hand, starting a new season of life, but on the other hand, really feeling very alone against the world. Uh, I remember, just so you guys can laugh at me, I have to tell you, my car, the air conditioning didn't work, which isn't a big deal in Michigan where I grew up, but in Phoenix, this car had a glass roof, it had T-tops, which were really cool, except for when it's July in Phoenix and it's literally like 115 degrees, And the sun is just roasting you. You're just like under a magnifying glass. And the car didn't have AC, so sadly I had to get rid of her. I still regret it. I wish I still had that. Anyhow, let's get back to the point here. When you find yourself in a new or changing season of life, how do you find meaning, fulfillment, and a team? I mean, maybe you've just arrived in a new city, or maybe you've arrived in a new season. How do you find, in the new season you're in right now, meaning, How do you find fulfillment? I mean, sometimes we get life all just the way we want it and we wish things wouldn't change, but things do change, don't they? Our relationships change, our bodies age, our jobs change. And when that happens, how do you find meaning again? How do you find fulfillment again? How do you find a team? At the end of our message, I'll show you a picture of me at that time in my life and you will be welcome to laugh at me. But I do want to tell you how I found these things, and we'll hear from Ben Utek how he find them. Most importantly, we'll hear from the Word of God about how you can find them. And you might be looking at this and you might say, you know, John, I'll take the meaning, I'll take the fulfillment, but I don't really need a team. I'm kind of a a loner. And by the way, if you're thinking that, you should know that I relate to that. Every time I take a personality test, I come out as an introvert. You probably wouldn't think that because I stand up here. But I'm not someone who naturally wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I need a team. But here's what I learned as a journalist observing life, and then as I've read the Word of God, and now what I've experienced in my life. I've learned this. Nobody wins the Super Bowl alone, right? You could take the best quarterback in the history of football, and you could put him out there for the Super Bowl against the worst team in the NFL, and guess who would win? The team. No one wins the Super Bowl alone, and guess what? It's the same with life. Even if you hit your financial goals, your success goals, you get the things and the material possessions around you that you think will fulfill you, if you don't have a team, people who know you, people who show up when you're sick, people who encourage you when you're sad, if you don't have a team, you will discover, even if you get all the stuff, that you're not actually winning at life. 
Here's a picture of Ben Utech, who we'll hear from today with that team that won the Super Bowl. And there's Ben right there, two people away from Tony Dungy as they're kneeling to pray after winning the Super Bowl. We'll hear from Ben about the team that has enabled him to win not only at football but in life. But really who we're talking about today is you. And so here's my question. Do you have a team? And here's what I mean. Do you have people you can eat with? Not just intake calories, that's good. But I mean, while you're eating, you can actually talk about, here's where I'm struggling financially. Here's where I'm stuck in my marriage. Here's this habit that I'm, I'm just embarrassed to admit. And I know other people struggle with it. And I, I wouldn't ever tell a big group, but I've got to tell someone. I just, I can't figure out how to stop this habit. Do you have anyone like that in your life? Do you have anyone who can put their hand on their shoulder and, and pray with you? Do you have anyone who can take you to the Word of God and say, here's a promise that you could claim for your situation? Well, to illustrate why this matters and how you can do it, I'll, I'll tell you three true stories today. One is Ben's, one is mine at the very end. But first, let's look at the true story of the very first followers of Jesus. You see, before they even had a church building, they started to meet as teams. We're told about it in Acts chapter 2. Here's how it goes. All the believers devoted themselves. And I want you to think for a moment about this word devoted. Because we're going to learn how you can experience a team that supports you and helps you and inspires you. And just like a winning football team doesn't happen by accident, it doesn't happen passively or accidentally, the kind of team that will really carry you through life and will really lift you up to championship moments that you couldn't get to on your own, it doesn't happen by accident. It happens through devotion. What is devotion? What does it mean to be devoted? It means this is something I do even on the days I don't feel like doing it. This is something that I'm committed to. And we know this in athletic, that the winning teams, they're devoted. They practice during the off season. They wake up when they need to go to practice. They're devoted. And so these early believers, they devoted themselves to a few things. The first was to the word of God, the apostles' teachings. We have those recorded in what we call the New Testament. They also devoted themselves to fellowship. That's when we gather together. When we gather together and there's laughter and there's joy and there's prayer and we share. They also devoted themselves to sharing in actual meals. If there's no other application you take today, it's this. Go eat a good meal with another follower of Jesus, okay? We can all do that, right? And they also devoted themselves to prayer. What's that mean? Well, typically in our groups, what that looks like is just going around the circle and sharing, here's a need I have. And, and what's so uh, incredible about this is you will see God answer prayers for other believers and it will strengthen your own faith. And then you'll have a prayer and you'll know that other people are praying for you. You're not in it alone. Well, what was the result of them being devoted to these things? Verse 43 tells us this. A deep sense of awe came over them all. Now, this word awe, it's actually where we get our word awesome. So this is not a churchy word. This is not a boring word. This is the idea of like, wow, this is incredible. That's what awe means. So how did these believers experience a deep sense of awe? It's because they were devoted to some specific things. And as they were devoted to these things, the apostles among them actually performed miraculous signs and wonders. I want you to think back on your life for a moment, your experiences with God. If you think of the most powerful times you've had with God, I would suggest, or I would guess that most likely you were in a group somewhere. You might have been at a camp, you might have been on a mission trip, you might have been at an Easter service. In my life, when I'm alone, I often hear whispers from God and I will uh, hear from the word of God as I read it alone, but I most often encounter the power of God when I'm in a group with other people. 
And sometimes I'll meet believers and they'll say, ah, I just don't, I, I haven't sensed God's power. I haven't really seen him do anything. I'll say, well, who's your group? Who are you with? Well, I'm just kind of lone rangering it. Well, then you're not likely to see the power of God. God shows his power almost always to groups. If you look at Jesus' miracles in the Gospels, most of the time when he heals someone, there's a group there. There's people around. There's something about groups. In fact, look at the plurals here in verse 44. All the believers, plural, met together in one place, just like we're doing right now. And they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Just like we learned today how we're going to help out Chris, a single grandma in our church. Every week, we as a church are helping out people in need right from our own church family here. They worship together at the temple each day. So big group worship like we're doing right now. And then they would meet in their homes. That's actually where they would take the Lord's Supper. We call it communion sometimes. And they shared their meals with great joy and with generosity. All the while, they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. In other words, this community, it was just this kind of organic community. They didn't own a building, but as they met in homes, there was such joy and hospitality, such care meeting each other's needs that unbelievers around would start to notice and be like, what's that group that you're part of? What's with all the Jesus followers? Why are you guys so happy? How is it that you guys meet each other's needs? And it was as a result of that that the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So people would see this activity and they would become curious and then they would join the movement. So how do you experience team in a way that's full of the power and joy of God? Here's what we learned from Acts 2 verse 42. You devote yourself to a community of believers. You devote yourself to some community of believers. And it's a community where you share your beliefs, you share your struggles, you have other believers you pray with. I, I, I don't think you absolutely have to eat together, but it's definitely in there. It's not a bad idea. And hey, why not, right? So it's when you devote yourself to some other believers actually doing, living life in these ways together that you really start to experience team in the way that God designed for you. Uh, here's some principles if you're a note taker, if you want to go deeper later. We saw that they devoted themselves to studying God's word, to eating together. They experienced answers to prayer together. They shared their experiences, their burdens, their blessings they also devoted themselves to meeting each other's needs, to gathering like we're doing right now in the big group, and then consistently meeting in homes. Each one of these you could really drill down into and study more. In fact, I want to point out something for you just so you know. On our website, every message is on there. This is last week's. And the reason I point this out is that underneath each message, there's a few buttons. And one of them is small group study. If you've never checked that out, I want to encourage you to click on it, even if you're watching online. Uh, we have people who do small groups in other states who watch us online. You can do a small group in your college dorm. You can do a small group on your lunch break. Uh, you can do a small group right here uh, in Hendricks County or in Indiana, and we'll tell you more about that today. But the reason I point this out is this. Every weekend when you gather here for a message, what I'm giving you at this time is really like the appetizer it's like the first course. Every single week, we prepare a study based on the message that goes far, far deeper. So you can study additional scriptures specifically to this message, to every message. You can read and answer specific application questions like, uh, where do you most need a team in your life right now? Or how have you experienced team? So this is something you can do on your own, and you'll get the most out of it if you do it as a group. But I want to make sure you're not missing out uh, on what we have available for you. Well, maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, okay, John, having a weekly study with other believers, that's not really my kind of thing. I mean, maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, that's great for the super Christians or that's great for the people 2,000 years ago, but I'm not that kind of person. I mean, what would that actually have to do with my life today? 
And to answer that question, I'm going to have Ben Utek answer it for you, actually. In this interview, you'll see me and Ben, we actually started off talking about problems in our marriages, problems that we both had and that you've probably had, very common problems. But as Ben starts to answer how God has gotten his marriage to a healthy place, you're going to see that it's his team, not the Indianapolis Colts, but his team of believers just like you and me who God has used in his life to make him the man he is today. Let's take a look. We were talking earlier, we were driving, and yeah. we were talking about marriage. We've both been married about the same amount of time, and that um, it's actually the lyrics of one of the songs you've written, that mm -hmm. it, it starts off like a fairy tale, yeah, but right, then it right. turns into yeah. truth, which is, you know, we all have bad breath in the morning, and it's real <laughs> life. And so, you know, if you're comfortable, share with us a little bit yeah. of, you know, some of the low parts or things that God has brought you and Karen through yeah. where, whoa, this isn't going the way we thought it would. Yeah. And how did you get through it? Yeah, I mean, I think if I'm being just completely vulnerable, I think a lot of the issues I've brought into our marriage have have really come out of, um, you know, have really come out of pride. Yeah. And I think, you know, growing up and having sports and and music and and so much so many of the things that I did they they just came naturally and they mm -hmm. came easily to me and I think they created a spirit of entitlement in my life um and and of pride and and arrogance uh, and there's so many layers to that um and I think I think the I think that the deepest valleys in our marriage have come out of Karin feeling like um like I cared more about myself than I did her. And, you know, when she has shared that with me, I mean, it was profound mm. because that's never what I would want for my wife to experience. And the fact that my actions and behavior would make her feel like I love myself more than I love her was, was really shattering. Um, but going back to the reality that God's personality is as much in my wife as it, is, yeah. as it is in me, imagine God saying to me, Ben, my concern is that you love yourself more than you love me, mm -hmm. right? Like that, those are those moments I'm talking about where yeah. even though Karen with tears in her eyes is, is, saying, is saying that to me, it's actually God also saying to me, wow. you know, it, you're, you're loving yourself. Your, your life is more about you right now than it, than it is about wow. me. And, you know, those are those yeah. moments with God, those mm -hmm. wrestling moments where you have to, you know, that song you, you, you quote, it starts out, it looked in the mirror, couldn't be clearer. I see what I've become. Wow. But I want to be who, who you said yes to yeah. the day we chose to love. Right. And that's, that is a, a reflection not only between the marriage that I have with Karin, but also a marriage that I have with my Heavenly Father. And, and so, you know, it's that disease of self in my own life that has, you know, hurt my wife in, in many times over the last 13 years. And, and, and it's working through th that reality. Yeah. You know, um, Paul David Tripp wrote a book called What Did You Expect? And it's the reality that um, marriage also means that one sinner married another sinner. And so when Karen married me, she married, she married the Prince Charming that she wanted to marry, but she also married a sinner. And she's had to experience, you know, the yeah. effect that my sin has on her life, you know? And, and, and vice versa, you know, Karen has, Karen has some of her own issues as a, as a, as a woman and, and through the identity she's trying to live out in Christ that, that, you know, create, you know, tense moments as well. That's why it's so important that we, that we're grounded in the truth 
because it's the only way we can get through those moments. Yes. Otherwise, you know, we would fall into the, this ever growing percentage of, of divorce in this country yeah. Yeah. because we don't have something, we don't have a, an absolute truth yeah. that we can go to when we're in those, yeah. those tough times. That's right. I, I love your vulnerability and honesty when you said, I had pride and entitlement in my life and in my heart. And yeah. the reality is every single person does. It's just so yeah. rare that people have the humility or even the eyes to see it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'd love to ask you, you know, first of all, how do we see that in ourselves? And then secondly, once we see it, how do we deal with it? How do we not be proud and entitled? Hmm. I know, sorry. <laughs> no, this is a really good question though, uh, John, because I saw it through accountability relationships. Wow. I had men in my life that um, that were fearless and that yeah. began confronting me in college mm. with these truths. Yeah. And it didn't go well. I, I, I was very uh, defensive. Mm. You know what? And maybe that's the Lord's answer to the question. Mm. I think I think whenever as men yeah. we react out of defensiveness. Wow. A red flag should go up. Yeah. Why are we why are we finding mm. defensiveness as our first reaction unless yeah. there isn't some truth? Yeah. Yeah. That has that has cut deeper yeah. than we expected it would. Right. And and so um, maybe if you're ever in a situation where you're you're having a difficult conversation with a mm. loved one and some of the things that they're saying are really beginning to you know, create um, uh, emotions within your heart, yeah. defensiveness, anger, frustration. Yeah. You have to, ask, if you can, ask yourself, why yeah. am I reacting this way? Yeah. And then you have to be open to the Lord allowing you to see yeah. the answer to that. Yeah. Which is not always, in fact, more often than not, it's an uncomf uncomfortable position to be yeah. in. Yeah. But if you're willing to go through that fire, yeah. you know, yeah. the refinement will be significant. Yeah. I, I love what you were sharing it, as far as this ability to see our own sense of pride and entitlement. You were sharing about that group of guys around you in, in college who helped you start to see that. I know um, I've got a brother I was just recently hanging out with and hearing the way he handles certain conflicts with his wife, with his kids, was to me a wake up call of some areas where I'm falling short and, you know, it's almost it the, on the one hand convicting, on the other hand, inspiring of like, whoa, I could do it like that. I could be like that. I want to be like that. Um, could you talk a little about the power of just having godly relationships uh, for us as men with other men, for women with other women? Yes. I mean, it's, it's so critical, right? Because it, it's, it's, it's the saying, it's connected to the saying of, of um, idle hands are, the devil's work yeah. or, or what is it? Idle hands are the devil's playground. Yeah, right? right. And it's what, what, what I, what I believe is true in that is that, um, um, when you're idle within your relationships mm -hmm. and you're left alone, mm -hmm. that's really where some of the greatest times of temptation are going to attack you. And it's so true in my life. Mm -hmm. Like my, my, I think my my greatest wounds exist mm. in my in my um, in my retreat from yeah. those friends and yeah. those those uh, accountability relationships, yeah. um, and so it's incredibly important to have um, relationships with people. You know, Hebrews says, "Surround yourself with a cloud of witnesses." Yeah. You know, be around people of like mind that are e that you are mm -hmm. equally yoked with. Because that's where the truth of my burden, yeah. it, you know, is is uh, easy, and my yoke yeah. is light comes from, you know. Yes. And so, um, those relationships are designed to be supportive, are designed yeah. to to allow you to be free yeah. uh, in yeah. who you in who God has created you to be. But you have to access them, right? And that's that's something that 
is important for all of us. Yeah. You mentioned when you were here playing for the Colts in Indianapolis and you were attending Connection Point that you guys joined a small group. Is that one place where you experienced those kind of relationships? Absolutely. You know, um, it was the first time I think that I had really been in a, a church community that that were, was very intentional about uh, about small groups and and uh, and really the invitation process and doing that well, and then um, and then cultivating those those groups uh, so that they can build and create new groups, yeah. right? So, um, especially as a as a professional athlete, when you're in a community as like I was at the time that was winning all the time, yeah. right? So you are a very well-known individual. Mm -hmm. you, you can, you, you really can't go out anywhere without being recognized. And, 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 you know, some of the, the realities that, yeah. that come out of being in that position. So, so to be able to escape that yeah. into a group of people that, that recognize all those things mm -hmm. about you, but they understand that that's just a part of who you are. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a part of what you do. It's not, it's not who you are yeah. and to and to be in that kind of a community was yes. i think very uh fulfilling yeah. and 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 important at that time because i needed that yeah. i needed that group i needed that support yeah. system yeah you you hit on something when we were talking about relationships that you know we have a tendency toward isolation and when we isolate we become more vulnerable to temptation just to poor choices to not seeing how entitled and prideful our hearts are at times. You know, what would you say to the person who's watching this and thinking, yeah, I, I know I need those kind of relationships in my life, but I'm too busy right now, or it's uncomfortable, or I tried it once and it didn't work. What, what would you say to those people? I think, I think you first have to, first you have to agree that having those types of relationships matter. Wow. Or else you'll never prioritize it. Yeah. If yeah. if you're someone who who doesn't believe it matters or just doesn't care, mm -hmm. then then you're you're never really going to yeah. apply it and yeah. experience all the fruit that is capable. Yeah. If you are someone that recognizes that that um, that these relationships matter, yeah. then my answer to you is no excuses, no explanations. Yeah which is that Tony Dungy saying. Yeah. If if it really matters and you know it can help your life, then you have to make time. Yes. There's no other way around it. I yeah. I can't I can't tell you how to fit it in to yeah. your life. You you have yeah. to make a choice. Yeah. And that may mean the cutting away of other things that this yes. would fill. That's right. That's and right. and and don't give up. Mhm. Mm okay, because God will never fail you. Yeah. People will. Yeah. And don't put the two in the same category. That's so good. If a person fails you, it's because they're a person. They're a human being who is imperfect. Yes. And don't use that as a reflection of, yes. of our Heavenly Father. Because He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. He's always there for you. And he will bring the right people into yeah. your life. So if one doesn't work out or if you're hurt by one, keep pursuing because he will fill that void. Yeah. And he's the one that's going to fill the void um, ultimately anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Such a great time with Ben. Such wisdom about really the real life challenges off the field that he has just like you and me in his marriage and in the rest of life. And Ben sharing that it was really in that small group right here at Connection Point where he, he and Karen as a young married couple had that community around them. Yeah, I got to tell you a story about a time when I ate some food and I got food poisoning. Has that ever happened to you? Eat at a restaurant and the food tastes really good and then you get home and uh, in this case it was dinner so I was up all night throwing up and, and the next morning I was just all worn out from, you know, being up all night sick and I vowed that I would never again in my life go back to that restaurant. 
Uh, and that restaurant is a national chain of Chinese restaurants. I said, I will never, ever eat there again. And so anytime someone invites me to go there, I say, uh, no, thanks. Uh, let's go eat somewhere else. But here's the thing. I haven't stopped eating altogether. And I haven't even stopped going to restaurants altogether. It's just that one. I know that one is dangerous, so I don't go there. But I, thankfully, I still go to other restaurants. And here's the thing, as you follow Jesus and you step out to be part of a community of believers, you're stepping into a group of other sinners and broken people who are also in need of God's help, and you will at times meet ones who aren't healthy. And I know as a pastor in my life, and I know for so many of you, you say, yeah, I've tried being in a small group before. Maybe you're at a place where it's like, I don't even know about church anymore because the place I was in last time, you essentially got food poisoning. And I want to acknowledge that that happens. And a good rule of thumb is don't go back to that restaurant, but don't stop eating, okay? And so if you've had a bad experience at a church or in a small group, it's okay to look for a different one, but it's not okay to stop eating. It's not okay to stop being devoted to a community of believers where you pray together, where you meet each other's needs. You need to be known in a committed relationship with other believers. You need to be known. You need someone who actually knows your struggles, someone who can actually share your joys, someone who can actually pray with you. And so that's really the question today. Are you known in a committed relationship with other believers? And if you say, yes, I would like that, but I'm not experiencing that, small groups are the easiest way to do that because they are designed so that all those things we saw, uh, eating together, reading scripture together, praying together, meeting each other's needs, all that is possible when you meet weekly with, you know, six to 12 other believers. And what you'll find in a group is that over time, one, one person in the group, they just lost a loved one. And it's deeply sorrowful, but there's another person in the group who just had a baby or a grandchild. And you start to have this balancing effect where you're, you're carrying their burdens, but then when you're going through a hard time, they're carrying your burdens. Every week here across our many, many small groups, there are small groups who are visiting people in the hospital from our church. There are small groups who are praying with people who are going in for another MRI to find out if it's cancer. There are small groups praying as they wait on biopsy results. There are small groups celebrating births and going to funerals. There are small groups bringing meals and providing needs. And this is the kind of community that God desires for you to have. We've got hundreds of groups and we've got openings for you right now in our groups. Or if you want to start one, we can help you start one. It's as simple as gathering a few friends together. I love this quote from Ben. He said, my greatest wounds exist in my retreat from those friends who bring accountability. Those friends who would say, hey, things are going really well for you at work. You're doing really well financially. How's your heart spiritually? How are you handling that? How are you carrying that? And the reality for all of us is this. At every moment of life, we are either retreating into isolation or we are advancing into relationship. And if you're anything like me, the retreat into isolation is much more comfortable. It's much easier to do, especially when life is busy, especially when life is hard. But when we retreat into isolation, Ben described it, that's when we often get ourselves into trouble. We make bad choices. We, we get depressed. And when we advance into relationship, it takes some courage. It takes some willpower. It's not always comfortable. But we choose to advance into relationship knowing that's where health and life are. I love this quote from Ben. He said, if it really matters and you know it can help your life, then you have to make time. I mean, no one else can choose it for you. You've just got to decide. Clearly, this helps people. Clearly, this is part of following Jesus. I need to be known in relationship with other believers. Is that true of me? And if not, I will advance. I will make time. And Ben, on the you know, Super Bowl winning team, can you imagine how hard they're working that season 
was making time for a small group right here in this church. And that means cutting other things away. You prioritize and you say, as I build my calendar, being in weekend worship, that's always something I'm going to be at. And then you grow and you take the step and you say, I'm going to be part of a group of some kind. And I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be devoted because that's when I can experience the awe and the power of God. Well, on the back of your program, there's a map. If you don't know where our gymnasium is, it's at the other end of our building. And we have a small group fair going on right now. Here's a little picture of it. There's uh, Colts inflatables in there. There's all sorts of tables for different kinds of groups. There's snacks down there. It's a no obligation kind of thing, okay? So you can go down there and you can just peruse. You can kind of shop and browse Whatever kind of group would best work for you in this season of your life, we most likely have it. We have groups that their common interest is running or some kind of working out. We have groups where the common thing is that they're all young marrieds in their 20s. We have groups uh, of every stage of life, groups of married couples, groups of non-married individuals, all sorts of groups. And if you don't have a community of believers where you're known, it is waiting for you today. It's just a few steps away at the other end of the building. Well, I promised you that I would share a humiliating picture from my early years in Arizona. And I told you I'd share with you three stories. We've heard Ben's story with small groups. We saw Acts chapter 2 that this comes from the heart of God and the word of God. And in my life, here's me in my um, early Right out of college days, you're welcome to laugh at me if you want. I'm pretty sure this was Halloween, and I was Johnny Cash, and there I am with the Pillsbury Doughboy, and it looks like Gandalf, maybe? I'm not sure. Anyhow, <laughs> here's the thing. I started attending a church very similar to this in Scottsdale, Arizona, a church of thousands of people where I couldn't have known everyone. And I told you I was this young single person in this big city trying to figure out who am I, where do I fit in the world? And I found some other people my age and we would always go to the same service together. And then we started doing this thing where after the service we would all go eat together, not at the particular Chinese place. <laughs> and then eventually we got into a small group. And it was in that small group that I really saw God answer prayers and I saw God transform people and I started to see God transform me. In fact, it was in that group that I started to really learn how to study the word of God and eventually learned that God had called me to be a teacher of his word to other people. You know, the power of who you surround yourself with, it shapes your future. And I look back on that season and the people I chose to surround myself with, they, they weren't other journalists. Uh, we all had different careers. Some were still in college. We probably wouldn't have been friends if it wasn't for Jesus. We just had that one thing in common that we were all saying, in my life, I want to try to follow Jesus. I want to figure out this Jesus thing. That's what we had in common. And I look back and it has completely shaped the trajectory of my life for the better. You know, after a while, I started getting to lead the small group and kind of teach the Bible in there. And one week, this girl, uh, we were always having visitors in and out of the group because we would show up at church and we'd be like, hey, do you have a group? Do you have a group? You got to come check out our group. We were just little uh, evangelists, I guess. <laughs> and so this girl, Tara, visited and, and, you know, she was nice. And the next week I saw her at church, I was like, hey, Tara, did you like the group? Do you want to come back? And she was like, yeah, I think I do. And here's my friend, Melanie. And she introduced me to Mel, and uh, here's Mel today, my wife. I met Mel because of the small group that I got to be part of. True story. This last week, I was talking on the phone with a friend from high school, and he said, John, I was looking at a picture of your family on Facebook. How in the world did you convince that woman to marry you? <laughs> Which is a totally reasonable question. And the answer is that I was in a small group. <laughs> but really, the, the answer is this. I, I tell you this to demonstrate, like, my life is what it is today. And I'm not saying it's perfect. But I, I'm free of addiction. I have great relationships around me. I get to do what I love for a living. My family, uh, you know, we're, our relationships are in a great place. My marriage is in a great place. All of this 
is the result of God's work in my life, but the way that I've experienced God's work in my life is that I've chosen to be devoted to a community of believers where together we're saying, what does God's word say? Let's help each other do it.